All right, so uh, so I'm gonna go ahead. I have started recording, and um, again, thanks everybody for being here. So if, if recording bothers you, or you don't want your video on or whatever, just know that we are officially recording. Uh, we, I think everybody that's on right now, I recognize, and you've probably been to stuff before, and we've seen you before. There were some people on the registration form I'd never seen, so that's kind of cool that we're getting some new folks. Hopefully, they'll show up. Uh, but for those of you who are brand new to us, uh, if there is anybody, or if you're watching this later. Uh, you're about to hear from Amy Hennessy, uh, Director on Outreach Economic of Outreach and Economic Education at the Federal Reserve Bank of Atlanta, also a former Georgia Econ Teacher of the Year and uh, all around extraordinary human being. And her co-presenter will be Princeton Williams, uh, Outreach Senior Advisor and also all around outstanding human being. So I'm going to be quiet and let them take over because they have lots of good stuff to share. Uh, Amy Princeton, the floor is yours. Thanks okay. for being here. Thank you, Chris, and thank you all for joining uh, at 4.30 after I'm sure a long um, day of work as well as the near the end of the week of a, of a school week in this crazy world that we are all experiencing right now. As always, I'm sure many of you are familiar with our disclaimer. So what Princeton and I will be sharing today are our views and they are certainly not the views of the Federal Reserve Bank of Atlanta, uh, of the Federal Reserve System, or the um, uh, Federal Open Market Committee. So Princeton, if you'll advance to the next slide. So I think we can all agree that we have faced in 2020 a year like no other year. Um, there have been and continue to be unprecedented challenges. Obviously the pandemic is driving a lot of this, but we see um, the, race, the unrest associated with um, Ahmed Aubrey, the Breonna Taylor, the George Floyd um, killing and the racial unrest and divide, the, the serious um, impact from uh, the ongoing hurricane season and the back-to-back -back hurricanes, for instance, in the Gulf region in St. Charles, um, and just the devastation um, that all those folks there are facing, the, the wildfires out west, the unprecedented acreage that is still aflame. Um, certainly this year has presented and, and all of the a fallout from the pandemic has just reinforced the fact that we still in this country have large swaths of the population that live in what we would call a food desert, where they just have um, um, serious issues around access to, to food. Um, we, we certainly know, and you are all experiencing the dramatic transformation that's occurring in, in education and the, the, what's come to light yet again, the digital divide and the fact that there is so much inequity still in terms of people's access to broadband and devices and so forth. Um, but you've been, Princeton, if you'll go ahead and advance, you all have been at the forefront. Personally, I think teachers are, are just, I think teachers are always heroes in my mind. Um, always, 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 and underappreciated. And um, I mean, as a teacher of 24 years myself, we all know we spend so much money out of our own pocket because of the insufficient uh, school budgets to be able to provide our students with exactly the best education that we can um, provide in our classrooms. Um, so you all, thank you for everything you've done. And you are those frontline workers, just like the medical workers, the first responders, those folks that have gone through um, this pandemic, being out there at the grocery stores, delivering the food and so forth, the transformation in so much of our, our activity, our day-to-day -day, um, activity has, has really brought to the fore what an unprecedented response there has been. Um, there's been, I feel, an unprecedented response um, both on the fiscal side of the house as well as the monetary policy side of the house. Um, and that's the primary focus of what we're going to share today. Um, but we've seen, you know, quite an unprecedented um, situation with the Centers for Disease Control and a lot of stuff that's played out with their guidelines and so forth. So we have had 
an unprecedented um, series of challenges this year, and we are um, seeing ongoing unprecedented response. And so I'm going to hand it over at this point to um, Princeton so he can share um, what we all love as econ teachers, uh, the data that really tells such a story when you look at the data and the graphs, um, quite a compelling story. So Princeton. All right. It's good to be with you guys today. Um, you know, these, I was on a webinar with goodness, somebody earlier. Oh, uh, a labor economist with the Upjohn Institute in Michigan. Um, and he just reiterated, it was good to know because this is how I was feeling that, that 2020 has blown up all of our charts because the scale is, is completely changed, right? Um, you know, this chart masks the fact that there was some really, what we thought were some pretty significant differences in growth rates in the four quarters of 2019, you know, but it, they look tiny compared to Q2 of, of 2020. Um, this is one point on data that I want you, that I hope that you guys emphasize with with your students. So there's all most economic statistics uh, we're going to look at two ways. We're going to look at the percentage change from over some period of time, and then we're going to look at what's called the level, so the actual value. I guess there's a third one where there's an index value. And we're actually gonna see one of those later, but this is percentage change. And as you can see in the second quarter of this year, um, GDP, overall real GDP dropped for over 30%, about 32%. Um, the numbers for Q3 um, will come out at the end of October, I believe October 29th. So next week sometime we'll, we'll see um, and most of the estimates so far, um, including from the GDP now estimate that the Atlanta Fed calculates, are saying that we'll have recovery, um, but probably not back to pre-pandemic levels. So um, that is what we're seeing. Um, then if you just look at the numbers, you see that the, um, that the GDP, we like to see it growing and we like to see, and we don't like to see this line coming down. It usually comes down during the recession. Um, it turns out the first half of 2020 is the only thing that makes 20, 2008 look better. Um, the plunge um, in, in real GDP now is just uh, staggering. The fastest onset of a recession in history, the NBER that that you can barely see the, the recession bar for what we're currently in, but it was just one of the most rapid economic declines in, in since they've been collecting these statistics. Um, and that pain is spread across the country. So this is from the BEA. Um, you can see that, that Georgia wins the race and, and that we have had the least amount of economic pain uh, that in a year that our, um, our economy in Georgia only um, shrank by 27.7%, that puts us in the best quintile of economic performance. Now think about that, that we've got a 28% decline in economic activity in the state of Georgia, and that's the best quintile. There's 80% of the country is doing worse than we are in Georgia. That's just blows my mind. Um, yeah. Should, Brianna has her. I was like, I oh my Brianna. gosh, I forgot to raise my hand up here. I'm usually yeah. the presenter. All right, just unmute. Yeah. <laughs> I, I'm looking at my slides and just go and count. Um, so do we think that that's because we stayed closed the shortest? I mean, we were only closed four weeks and Governor Kemp was ready to rock and roll with, especially in these major cities like Savannah and Atlanta. I think part, if we want to bring politics into it, I, I feel it was from like with the possible move with the um, convention at that time when, when South Carolina was not gonna be the host. So do we think that that number is reflective of the length of time that we actually stayed closed? So I'm not sure if you can make that comparison because I would think our neighbor to the South had almost as quick of a reopening yeah. and and they're in the, in the center of quintile. So they're in the kind of the right in the middle of the pack. Um, so I'm not sure that that's it. I think we had a, 
we have a resilient economy. I mean, I think we probably had poor, I don't know, is actually the, the real answer there is that I don't know. Um, I would think you do see that larger states often had a harder time, right? Um, and yeah. then the Northeast where the pandemic hit first. Um, you know, it'll be really interesting to see how these numbers shake out once Q3. I think you're going to see the recovery more in Q3 and, and kind of see the effects of that. Uh, this is only through Q2, so you're still getting kind of right in the depths of the of the pandemic okay. and really started to recover yet. Um, of course, a large portion of what uh, drives GDP and a, a GDP number that we get more often is personal consumption expenditures. And we just, like you all know, I mean, this is all intuition and you saw it in April, personal consumption just bottomed out. It's recovered, but notice that it's only recovered back to what it was in early 2019. It, it has not recovered to pre-pandemic levels. And if consumption is still below pre-pandemic levels, then GDP is still going to be below pre-pandemic levels because it's, you know, PCE runs about 68 to 70% of GDP overall. So it's a huge component that's driving how, how, how the recovery is shaping up. Um, of course, what really drives consumer um, spending is in large part consumer sentiment. We, we all think about what we, we make decisions about spending based on how we feel about our economic future and, and all of that. Uh, you can see that, that consumer sentiment, according to the University of Michigan, one of the, the best surveys of consumer sentiment, um, it hasn't really recovered. And it's been very uneven through the summer um, as, it's, as there's been some recovery. And then I would suspect you could correlate the, this chart with the, with the summer surge, that is you saw a second surge of cases in the summer, you saw consumer sentiment probably decreasing again. So, so sentiment drives consumption, consumption drives GDP. So you're really seeing um, a tail building here. Um, here's another one that, that is a percentage. So this is the level of unemployment rate. Um, you've got uh, an enormous spike and a lot of recovery, but notice that, we're, that, that the unemployment rate had been trending down and even with the significant way that the economy has started to lower that unemployment rate, we're still back at a 2012 rate of unemployment, right? We had been through, for, for eight years, the unemployment rate had been slowly dropping down to historically low levels. And, and that has just been erased. The unemployment rate is still far above what it was pre-pandemic. Um, Last thing I want, want you to notice on this is notice that this slide, the axis, that vertical axis goes from 2.5 to 15%, right? And we've got a, an unemployment rate right now around 8%. Everybody see that? Uh, this next slide is the unemployment rate for adult African-American or black men. So first of all, the scale is totally different, right? Overall unemployment rate is running uh, somewhere around 8%. Um, African-American unemployment rate is over 12 and a half percent. So this, the, the kind of the new catch phrase um, in discussing the economy and the recovery is not that we're gonna see a V, then there was a talk of not a V, but there was gonna be a W where the economy dipped and then recovered and then, you know, a so-called double dip recession. The newest talk that, that I'm hearing from policymakers and pundits is a K-shaped recession so that you're seeing the, uh, the economy coming out and part of, the part of the sectors of the economy doing really well and recovering almost completely. And the other part um, of the economy still in deep recession, still with a lot of pain. And we're gonna see those, those numbers here in just a second. Um, in fact, right here, um, if, you if you put Georgia workers in three buckets, right? High wage workers uh, that make more than $60,000 a year, 
middle wage workers that make 27 to 60 and low wage workers that make uh, less than $27,000 a year. This is going back and what they've done is they, this is the index, right? So, um, so we go back to January, of, January 15th of the year before the pandemic. And if we kind of set all those equal to each other, well, low wage workers have only recovered have not recovered, they still have lost overall 15.8% of, of the jobs in those low, low wage um, sectors. In fact, if you're a high wage worker, you're better off now than you were before the recession. There are more high wage jobs, high wage employment than there was before the, before the pandemic and before the recession that, that um, resulted. Uh, and that's the case um, overall in the economy. As of middle of August, when, when the last time this chart was updated, uh, low wage employment was down 18%, where high wage employment overall in the economy across the United States is only down 1%. Um, I want to. I, I, I would like to suggest that you um, share the source. This opportunity insights, the, the economic tracker that's been developed by Raj Chetty. I think they're, we're going to share the slides, but I think they're really going to find that if they aren't already aware of it and, and using that as a resource with their students, they'll find it really very valuable. Yeah, we'll have the link in the, in the PowerPoint deck. I've got it in the notes. Um, before we share it, I'll make sure it is, and I'll hyperlink the, the logo there at the top. That's what I was about to say. The, these last two charts are, are in a really rich database um, called Opportunity Insights. You can just Google that site. Uh, it's a collaborative project between several institutions, uh, Ivy League institutions, that are really looking at how the pandemic is, is not equal and the outcomes of the recovery are not equal across income levels. So, um, and, and for me, one, one of the things that I find the most fascinating about what they're doing is they're so, so many of, so the BEA, the BLS, this data is collected monthly, quarterly, et cetera, and there's lags, they're going out and using various different um, sources that provide real-time data on payrolls, um, burning um, glass and, and so forth, um, and, and uh, point of sale data and so forth to do tracking, to really show, and they actually disaggregate it all the way down to zip code level and so forth. And they can show, speaking to what Princeton said, they can show kind of where the, the pain is greatest um, in certain zip codes and where, where it just, you just don't see evidence of it. Right. Mm -hmm. and, and there's even, all the way down to how low wage workers are faring in affluent neighborhoods. I mean, there's it's just got a tremendous amount of data mm -hmm. from some really respected names in economics these days. Mm -hmm. um, this was last week. Uh, this is another one of those slides where the um, I clipped it straight from AP. Um, you've got, the, but the um, the numbers, the scale has just been blown up. Right, so you have all of the initial unemployment claims in the Great Recession, right, peaking there um, just before the January first, twenty ten uh, level, and we're still above that rate. We are still above in initial claims. We are still above the rate at the height of the Great Recession. So, to say nothing of a of a pot of a of a peak a 6.9 million weekly, 6.9 million initial unemployment claims uh, that just, well, it's just unprecedented. Um, there's actually a, the, the state unemployment, this labor economist that I heard earlier this week was talking about the fact that um, this has just been such an unprecedented challenge that state agencies, there's some questions about even this data because of how state agencies are collecting it and all that, they're just overwhelmed. In fact, the BEA numbers that, that were associated with this are incomplete because California has paused its entire reporting process because they've got such a backlog of claims that they haven't been able to process. So we are still 
mm -hmm. actively trying to understand the impact of this recession and understand the depth of the economic harm that's been caused in literally a very compressed time frame. You just, I mean, March to October is not a long time because these statistics, and that's one of the things like Amy was saying, that we're having to turn to new ways of finding data because all of these very stable government reports that we have come to rely on are just not built to be responsive in this short compressed time frame. You have to, they're designed to be slow and steady and, and that wins the race, but that doesn't tell you a story when the economy is changing so dramatically, so quickly. Um, well, so we've talked about production and we've talked about um, unemployment, obviously important measures. Uh, you might expect something about the, um, the Fed and we would talk something about inflation. Um, so I, Amy and I, when we were putting these together, we, we layered two things here. So uh, the blue line is the Fed's preferred measure of inflation, the Personal Consumption Expenditures Price Index. So you can see, and that is measured on the right-hand axis. You can't see me pointing to my screen, but I'm really actually pointing to that right-hand axis. Um, and so you can see that the inflation rate had peaked just before the recession at about 1.88%, right? 1.875, um, it was already coming down. And then it just plummeted to less than one half of 1% at an, on an annualized basis, right? So, um, just a dramatic poll, please. Go see mommy. Go, go, <laughs> go see mom. Mom's home. The dogs can't decide if she wants to stay with dad or go see mom. It's just, it's all a flutter at the Williams household. Um, and the reason we layered this is that, that the Fed, and Amy's going to talk about this in a little bit, the Fed has had this dramatic reaction. Uh, an unprecedented easing of monetary conditions. And, and so you see that the, the money stock has go, gone through the roof, right? Uh, it's, it's dramatically increased, but that has been accompanied by the inflation rate falling. So the, the charge that the Fed is creating inflation through our easy money policy doesn't hold water based on this chart. Um, Many of these slides are actually from the FRED database of the St. Louis Fed. And we actually created a, a dashboard called Pandemic Economics that measure a bunch of these. Uh, and that is publicly available. Uh, we're gonna send you the slides and this link will be in those slides so that you can use those. And if you've not used FRED, what's amazing is, is that we had done this presentation, like Chris said, for GCSS a month or two ago. I went back out to Fred. I pulled down all the charts and met into a slide deck, and it does that automatically. So it was all updated for me uh, without me having to do to pull all the numbers again. So it's a fantastic resource. And with that, I'm going to turn it back over to Amy to talk about the response. Thanks, Princeton. So. Faced with all of that data, and while what he shared, you you saw because it's the the graphs are current with the current um, releases. Um, you think back, obviously in March, as the markets are roiling, and what on earth can be done? to stabilize the markets. You think as information is um, being presented to Congress and to members of congressional committees about what is coming in terms of the virus, um, what can be done to be responsive. So we, we need to address what has been the fiscal and monetary policy response this year. And if you'll advance, all of you know um, that fiscal policy is conducted in concert between the U.S. Congress and the U.S. President and its um, efforts to change um, spending um, and uh, or and or uh, tax policies. 
monetary policy is conducted by the Fed, specifically the policy body, the Federal Open Market Committee. And we use some traditional tools. And as all of you know, because of the Great Recession, we use traditional tools and then we have emergency powers under Article 13.3 um, in ed exigent circumstances to create some unconventional tools. And so that's what we're gonna to, uh, kind of focus on now. So if you'll advance. So the fiscal policy response, that's gonna be our focus first. Um, and I like to think about the response in March on the fiscal side uh, in contrast to the uh, fiscal response to the Great Recession and, and actually to the financial crisis and everything imploding in 2008 into 2009. And what you have to understand is the CARES Act, the Coronavirus Aid, Relief and Economic Security Act that was passed this March, um, in contrast to the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act of 2009, is a, a, a beautiful way to really emphasize the difference in terms of very partisan passage of um, legislation versus a bipartisan act. So the um, um, ARA in 2009, passed in February of 2009, had no House Republicans vote to pass it and only three members, three Republican members in the Senate. So it was completely a partisan piece of legislation. It appropriated $831 billion as stimulus. When compared to the CARES Act that was passed in March, signed by uh, President Trump on March 27th, it's a $2.2 trillion economic stimulus package. It was passed unanimously in the Senate on March 25th and with a near unanimous voice vote, which is a non-recorded vote on March 22nd in the House. Um, literally the $2.2 trillion is 10% of total US GDP. So it is the single largest stimulus bill ever passed by the United States Congress and signed by a president in our history, both in size and scope. Now the Congressional Budget Office has conducted uh, an, an initial analysis and has projected that it will actually end up costing less than $2 trillion because some of the assistance has been in the form of loan guarantees, which will not have a net effect on the budget. Up to $454 billion of the allocation are funds as a backstop that went into the Treasury's emergency stabilization fund that are a backstop to the Fed's emergency lending facilities, which we'll talk about when we when we talk about the monetary policy response. So the CBO is estimate is estimating that because of the income and the costs that are going to stem from those lending facilities, that they're going to be offset each other. So there's going to be no deficit effect from that provision, the emergency stabilization fund provision. Um, the CARES Act that was passed and signed on, um, on March 27th actually is phase three. There are actually two um, pieces of legislation that were uh, passed first before March 27th. So um, on March 6th, a um, Coronavirus Preparedness and Response Supplemental Appropriations Act was passed and that was to allocate um, appropriations to coronavirus vaccine research and development. So on March 6, a week before we all shut down, um, kind of went working remote on March 13th, which is really like that telltale day. And then on, on phase two on March 18th, the week after, they passed the Families First Coronavirus Response Act, which um, provides um, funds for free coronavirus testing. It, it allocated funds for increased uh, food stamps, uh, funding for food stamps, and paid sick leave and some unemployment benefits, 14 paid days of paid sick leave for American workers who were affected directly by the coronavirus. Now, as of today, October 22nd, we see that phase four has still not been enacted. We are still working on phase four. The House passed an updated version 
of what is called the HEROES Act on October 1st. The Senate has still not acted. Um, and what this means is that there still need to be extensions, um, ongoing um, extensions to unemployment insurance benefits. Um, there's there's hope that there would be extensions on the Paycheck Protection Program, on health care funding, state and local government fiscal relief, uh, education child care funding, just to name a few, as so many of these initial stimulus dollars have, you know, sunset, and yet there's still so much, as Princeton referenced, the, the K recovery, there's that those elements in the economy, the, the groups in the economy that are not feeling uh, fully recovered or not experiencing full recovery. And there's going to be a wave of, um, as more sunset provisions occur, there's going to be a wave of, of more hurt um, to, to many groups. So if you'll advance a breakdown of the CARES Act, here are basically the four buckets. You see the assistance for American workers and families, um, the assistance for small businesses, the preserving jobs for American industry. So that's big corporate um, and, and allocations there. And then the bucket for state, local and, and um, municipalities and then local, uh, excuse me, the tribal governments. So if you'll advance. So what fell in that bucket that was $300 billion allocated for what are called economic impact payments. So I would imagine most people on this call got the $1,200 per adult. Um, and if you had the treasury used, the IRS used your 2018 or 2019 tax filings, and if you received your payments electronically, it was pretty quick order that, that those checks went out. Um, uh, households with children, that were under the age of 17 got an additional $500 per child up to $3,400 for family of four. Um, and taxpayers who did not file returns just had to submit a simple tax return. It was all deposited electronically if it had been filed and then your returns were received um, electronically as I said. But there were also some payments for social security recipients and railroad retirees who may not have had a file tax return um, but, and had not filed one, but they were also eligible. Now, there was also as part of this bucket, the unemployment benefits and the extension, it was $361 billion that was allocated. It was um, went into effect beginning the week of, of uh, the signing of the bill actually uh, on March 27th, but ended uh, at the end of July, on July 31st, and it it provided an additional $600 per week of unemployment insurance benefits on top of each individual state's allotment of unemployment insurance benefits. So this was in addition to. Now, the economic shock that was that occurred, the the literally falling off the cliff. Um, in terms, you know, the, the rise in unemployment, all these people being laid off, furloughed, et cetera, um, is an economic shock that is going to trigger an automatic stabilization of extended benefits in states. And that happened less than one month after passage of the CARES Act. That's all of that that you guys teach about the fact that you've got some built-in automatic stabilizers um, that are just part of the, the policies in place. Um, this, however, was unprecedented. Now, the problem is once the um, triggers go in reverse, once everything lapses, it's going to turn off automatically as well. And it's turned off and it did turn off. And yet the labor markets, as we saw with Princeton's graphs, haven't fully recovered. And for some demographics really have not fully recovered. So um, on August 8th, uh, President Trump signed an executive order because Congress at that point, and still to this day, hasn't had a face another extension, another iteration of the CARES Act. Um, he used FEMA's Lost Wages Assistance Program 
to extend the, un, uh, the enhanced unemployment benefits. And the federal government said you can extend it, not the full 600 extra a week, but 400 extra per week. The federal government will provide 300 of those dollars and states will be expected to provide 100 if they can, most states can. So this was signed on August 8th. It was had a six week time frame to date. As of today, 49 of the 50 states applied for it. Um, ter US territories applied for it. The only state that did not apply for those dollars that were allocated was South Dakota. Um, but at this point, every other state and all the territories have. Um, and as of now, 39 of the $44 billion funds allocated for this have actually been paid out. But most all state, well, over half of the states have already paid it out. So it's already done. For instance, as an example, Texas started right away. They filed, they got access to it. They, they paid it out into September and boom, it was done by mid-September. Um, some states that applied later and part of the problem was actually just getting everything in place to deploy the funds. They literally had to work on how do we do the calculation and allocate um, and, and what is in essence the, um, the platform by which we're going to do all these calculations and get the funding out there. Um, and you had to, as a, an unemployed um, worker, you had to qualify because you were unemployed due to the coronavirus, due to the pandemic, to qualify to get this extension. So you have to have proof of that. Um, so that's been a glitch for some states. And as a result, um, some states are still right now paying out. But m more than half of those that qualified are done. Um, Georgia being one, for instance. All right, so another part of this bucket um, was uh, related to student loans. Um, so they suspended payments on the, the accrual of interest on federal student loans through the end of September. Um, and they continued paying students and federal work uh, study programs if they were unable to work due to COVID-19. And they provided $14 billion in aid to um, colleges to provide cash grants for students. It included provisions for foreclosures and eviction moratoria. Now, the protection for borrowers with federally backed mortgages from foreclosure ended at the end of August, August 31st. There was um, an eviction moratorium that was in place for rental units that are part of federal assistance programs or federally backed mortgages or multifamily mortgages. That ended um, at the end of June. Um, and then it provided, um, a, it permitted the right to request mortgage forbearance for up to 180 days. So again, this is why there's such an urgency of having another uh, kind of phase four passed to address some of these because we are truly facing a wave of evictions um, because those moratoria have been lifted. And many, many municipalities have already begun allowing for those evictions to ramp up. And um, so we're seeing a lot of pain in that space and it's just a growing wave. Um, now, the assistance for small businesses, to, it was designed to keep payroll, um, keep employees on payroll, to hire back laid off employees and to cover overhead. Um, there was $350 billion um, that, were initial, that was initially allocated in March, that amount had to be increased. And so literally, um, it, there, there was an amendment on June 5th um, and they, they allocated an additional 300 so, billion. So the total amount was 669 billion. So this is where you got what's called the Paycheck Protection Program. It was administered by the Small Business Administration, supported from the treasury, but literally facilitated by the Fed um, because uh, you, so funds that are come from congressional appropriations that are, go through um, assistance programs and so forth have to go through depository institutions. So the treasury can't directly loan directly into an individual's bank account um, through a lending program 
to a bank's bank account. And so literally the Fed became the, the entity that facilitated all of those transactions. Um, so who was eligible? Small business, certain nonprofits, veterans organizations, tribal businesses, et cetera. A lot of self-employed and independent contractors. And um, all of that was facilitated through banks and credit unions and a few non-bank and non-insured depository institutions through what is called the Fed's, <clears throat> another one of our acronyms, Paycheck Protection Program Liquidity Facility, the PPPLF. And this is how that liquidity was provided to those participating financial institutions um, through term financing backed by the PPP loans. Now, what's interesting and, and some initial research is showing is that there were a number of, um, I'll, I'll give a, an example. So some small independently owned um, uh, hotels that applied, got approval to get access to a loan, but didn't actually take the loan because the provisions for this program was you had to keep employees on the books or you had to guarantee you were hiring them back to qualify. And what they determined is their business wasn't coming back. They weren't getting more customers. They didn't have the need to have the employees because they didn't have the customers. So they didn't end up taking the loans. Um, and that has happened in many instances. They've just not seen the recovery in certain segment se sectors, especially hospitality and leisure. Um, so not all of those funds have been, alloc have been um, claimed. One thing I forgot to mention, and I did want to mention this because this is very unique, um, with the first bucket, the Assistance for American Workers and Families, um, very unprecedented. They provided um, unemployment, it's called pandemic unemployment assistance to contract gig part-time workers, freelancers and the self-employed and it provides for those folks up to 39 weeks of unemployment to those folks out there working as freelancers and gig workers, part-time workers who otherwise would not have been um, eligible in normal times to unemployment insurance benefits. And it's for up to 39 weeks and it expires at the end of this year on December 31st. Again, unless something's done to extend those benefits into 2021. All right, if you'll advance, Princeton. So the preserving jobs for American industry, this was $500 billion allocated for large corporations. The goal was to you know, provide kind of employee retention. So providing employers with a way to, to retain employees um, and, and have some deferments such as payroll tax deferral um, where employers could opt to defer the payment of the employer share of so the social security tax. And then, so defer those payments and the first half would have been paid by the end of 2021 by December 31st of 2021. And the second half would have been paid by December 31st of 2022. I know specifically our employer sent out a message early on that they had made the decision that they were not gonna do that because ultimately that, that has to get paid back at some point. Um, and they, they felt that they didn't need to do that. Um, this also provided um, that payroll support for the big, um, so it got a lot of attention, the big air, air carriers that have been just devastated by the drop off in, um, in air, air, airline bookings. Um, so this provided up to $25 billion um, and it, they were supposed to, on payroll from April till the end of September, keep their workers on payroll um, if they received these funds. So the big ones that you know are Delta, Southwest American and United, they received the largest um, amounts. Those folks, those, those corporate entities had to provide a 10 year unsecured promissory note 
and, or a warrant for shares of common stock to the US Treasury as a backstop of receiving those funds. But there were over 340 recipients of these funds, very much smaller amounts. And most of those went to, most of those dollars went to small limited liability um, corporate charter jet firms. Uh, about 4 billion went to cargo air carriers. And then about 17 billion went to certain contractors that are considered um, essential to national security. Um, so that, that is that. And then finally, we have the assistance for state, local and tribal governments for DC and the US territories. That was $150 billion allocated there. And payments from this fund could only be used to uh, cover expenses that were directly related to those state, local governments and the uh, tribal governments, public health emergency um, issues related to expenses related to COVID-19. Um, they could not be used for anything that was in the municipality's budgets as of March 27th. And they are literally then those expenses that have been accrued since and through the end of this year. Um, they were eligible to, um, you know, all the eligible governments had to submit a certification by April 18th. And for me, this is one of the most fascinating aspects of what I'm about to tell you because of this being the year that, of the census. Treasury used US Census data to determine how those funds were allocated to all those state and local governments. And yet again, reinforcing the really critical reason why the census and the collection of the census data is essential. Um, there are serious concerns right now that if indeed the census has been dr even more dramatically undercounted, that there are a lot of uh, state and local governments that are about to really be affected adversely, ultimately, from the grants that they get for transportation dollars. Uh, you know, so many of these public funds that come through those allocation um, formulas that are driven by that census data. At any rate, so um, if you'll advance Princeton, um, I just like to, before I hand it back over to Princeton, I just like to emphasize that um, uh, Chairman Powell has um, spoken to the fact that recently, very recently, that we really need to um, continue thinking about this monetary and fiscal policy response acting in concert. And that, as you can see in that quote, he, he's saying that right now, there's this asymmetry in terms of how you provide the support. If, if we provide too little support, you're gonna have an even weaker recovery. And speaking to that nature of it possibly being this K recovery where the, the haves are recovered or are recovering and the have nots continue to struggle um, versus having you know this fear of another stimulus package that is too much. Um, and he really just doesn't see the signs right now that another stimulus um, package would be um, the wrong response. Um, and then our president, President Bostic, was literally this past Sunday on face, CBS's Face the Nation. And he just reinforced this whole issue that there are still so many communities, especially low-income communities, communities of color, um, that have not rebounded, that are still very much hurting and, and must, must get that support um, ongoing um, because they're facing going even further over the edge. So um, Princeton, I'll hand it over to you. All right, very good. Um, lots of experienced economics teachers on this call, but um, remember, I'm gonna turn a little bit to the Fed. Uh, you know, it's Fed presentation, so we're gonna say, a little bit about the Fed here. Um, as Amy was mentioning, the whole role of the fiscal agent of the United States becomes really critical in this because the government, the, the US Treasury depends on the Federal Reserve as a central bank to implement many of these policies. We 
we um, we process the loans. We we are the government's bankers, so we are we take an outsized role in this over and above the the policy response that we uh, that we devise. Um, you know, this uh, the pandemic is a really important time to remember just the structure of the Federal Reserve that Congress uh, created this three part structure. Um, with the Federal Open Market Committee uh, being the blend of the both the Board of Governors and the Federal Reserve Banks, because you do have this, this structure that emphasizes different roles for all three parts. So the Federal Reserve Banks are on the ground working with local banks, implementing these, these, these changes. The Board of Governors is overseeing this and making decision related decisions. And the FOMC is meeting um, Amy's going to talk about just this unprecedented time in early March where the FOMC had emergency meetings uh, to, to roll out uh, new tools of monetary policy in a rapid response to the, to the growing economic crisis. Um, you know, every, I've been at the Fed since 2006, so, um, so I started with in Dallas and, and then two years in, had the um, had the Great Recession, and I said that I thought I had redone my Fed 101 presentation more than any other Fed employee, and and we're still working on redoing it. Um, our responsibilities change and morph, and the way we describe them change and morph. So you probably have a um, we talked for a long time about a three-legged stool, where we talked about monetary policy, supervision and regulation, and payments. Um, now we're talking about a five-legged stool, maybe. I don't know if, if that's if there's such a thing as a five-legged stool, um, but we emphasize five responsibilities that are broad in the economy, and and we're going to talk about those. So it's monetary policy, financial system stability, supervising and regulating financial institutions, payment and settlement system safety and efficiency, and then consumer protection and community development. So. We're going to take each one of those um, with a little more emphasis on the first three. So um, remember that monetary policy has this dual mandate. So um, we are working on, you'll, many of you will recognize that this is a clip of the infographic about monetary policy. And in the new uh, version of this, it's getting sent to the printer in the next week or two. We're going to be changing that because the FOMC has revised its guidance. They they now have a long run projection that we can have an unemployment rate in somewhere in the neighborhood of four to 4.3%. Remember the goals are set by Congress. So Congress amended the Federal Reserve Act and said we should do monetary policy to promote maximum employment, stable prices and moderate long-term interest rates. But the FOMC defines how to measure those goals. So Congress doesn't set the 2% inflation target they don't, the law doesn't describe what maximum employment means. That's up to the FOMC. And related to that, um, you know, the, the hot ticket, the best dance card to get is in, in, the, in the heady world of monetary policy economics um, is to get an invitation to Jackson Hole, Wyoming at a conference that is sponsored by the Kansas City Fed. It's where all the cool economists hang out. Um, every year, but this year it was really interesting because it was a virtual event because of the pandemic. And so it actually had a wider um, impact and a wider reach than normal because it is a very, it's kind of like the Davos thing. It's, it's by invitation only. So Chair Powell's um, address to Jackson Hole is actually out there on YouTube. Um, and what he talked about is, is one of those earth shaking announcements if you're a Fed watcher, right? So earth shaking to a Fed watcher is different than earth shaking to everybody else in the world, but this was big. So what, what Chair Powell said was that we're gonna look at an average of the inflation rate so that we are going to continue to look for an average of 2%, but that because it's an average and we've been below 2% for an extended period of time, we're going to anticipate that in the recovery, we could be above 2% for a period. The importance of that is, is that the, the FOMC is acknowledging 
that they're going to tolerate a small amount of inflation above the 2% limit to see how far down unemployment can go. You guys all talk about the Phillips curve, you teach the ADAS model, and you know that there's this kind of implied trade-off. But we also know from the data, especially going into 2020, that we had experienced very low unemployment and very low inflation. And so the, the reality of this announcement is, is that they're going to see how low unemployment can go before they start to tighten the screws on the, on the monetary policy, even if that means that, that inflation runs above 2% for a while. And we're happy to address questions about that either now or that's probably one of the bombshells. Anybody got a question about that? If not, save it for the end and we'll take more questions at the end. Susan, I see you unmuted. Yeah, so do you mean he was saying, I mean, I just talked today with my kids about, you know, um, the, the, we haven't had unemployment this low since 1955. You know, those were the news uh, stories before the pandemic hit. So right. they're, they're mm -hmm. saying they're willing to let inflation go up to see if we're gonna go below those 1955 numbers or do they just feel like unemployment is gonna be so cranky and difficult to get rid of during this recession that they're gonna worry less about? No, this is an ongoing policy change. Um, mm -hmm. So they're saying that, that because we've been below 2% inflation for a long time, right? And those historically low unemployment numbers were achieved without um, without pushing even all the way to 2%, that they're going to tolerate inflation, maybe even going above 2%, so that they can see how far down unemployment can go. Because remember that we talk about a headline unemployment number, mm -hmm. but but the, the other acknowledgement in this, this is that there are subgroups of the US economy that are not experiencing historically low unemployment. And so if we can push the overall unemployment rate down and then begin, I mean, really going into 2020, you did see um, many subgroups, minorities, and that, that were having low, the unemployment rate was finally coming down. And then that just shot back up during the pandemic. So um, I think the acknowledgement is, is that we're gonna look at more broadly and continue to try to see that unemployment rate push down so that it has a broader impact across you, across minority groups uh, and across all demographics in the United States. And acknowledging that, that there's not gonna be a tightening if and when inflation starts creeping up toward 2%, where some Fed watchers might have anticipated if you got to 1.8, 1.9% in inflation, maybe there would have been some expectation that the Fed would begin tightening. Mm -hmm. My, this is Princeton Williams, the opinions expressed with those of the presenter, right? Um, you know, they're saying, don't freak out that we're gonna tighten just because we're getting toward 2%. We may even go over that to see if we can continue to push unemployment down. Amy, is that a fair way to say that? Yeah. Excellent. Mm -hmm. My understanding as well. All right. So that's big news, you know, shocking in, in our world, right? And I will say this, I, my understanding is this is not something that they've only started talking about as it relates to the pandemic. They've been, there's been indication from the FOMC minutes and so forth for a while that they've been looking at this and, and grappling with this and the right. research departments at the different districts have been talking about it and so forth. Well, in fact, in the communication, to get a little bit into the weeds, but not try to not get too far, in the communication about this that, that, chair, that went live when Chair Powell made the speech, um, they actually have committed to a, a regular review of monetary policy. This had been a two-year process of people going all around the country. Mm -hmm. So Michelle Bowman came to, to Georgia and went to Augusta to uh, to have a listening session with the econ with with local economic leaders and and people from across the business spectrum and the education world and all of that and I think 
And so all of this is a result of a two year long, long before anyone had heard of COVID-19, this review was underway. Um, but I think it, the pandemic and the economic consequences of the pandemic certainly highlighted the importance of this change in tactic. Yes. All right, Amy. So, so as I talk about the monetary policy response, I really want you to think about all, we're gonna highlight all of these five primary functions. And I'm gonna first focus on um, the, the po monetary policy response, um, the, the response that helped to stabilize the financial system, keeping that the broader financial system in mind, and then changes that occurred this time with um, our supervisory and regulatory um, uh, function of financial institutions. So if you'll advance. Um, <clears throat> so again, the markets were roiling in early March. And as the markets were roiling, um, the Fed, in an unscheduled FOMC meeting, cut um, the Fed funds rate 50 basis points. Um, then, uh, yet again, you know, remember we go into remote mode on March 13th, and on March 15th, another unscheduled meeting, they took even greater actions. They cut even more. They brought us back down to the zero um, uh, lower bound. They implemented these major swap lines, dollar swap lines with major central banks, which I'll, I'll reference. They increased treasury per, uh, purchases um, um, of at least 500 billion, the mortgage-backed security purchases of 200 billion, um, and they cut the discount rate spread um, relative to the Fed funds rate spread. And then also on March 15th, they did some supervisory changes. They re realized that they needed to eliminate um, some reg or kind of provide waivers on some regulatory guidance because this was gonna have an impact on depository institutions balance sheets, um, which was gonna potentially impact um, their efforts to provide liquidity to the markets. And then also they eliminated the reserve requirements. How many of you ever thought that the, you know, there would be zero required reserve ratio? Zero. And there is no sign or indication in the offing at all that they're gonna come off of that zero um, required reserve ratio. And then because of all of these actions, the officially scheduled FOMC meeting on March 17th and 18th was canceled. So if you'll advance. I was just gonna say, oh, go you know, ahead. I went back and looked at the calendar just now. Uh -huh. March uh -huh. 15th was a Sunday afternoon. Yep, I yep. Mean, cause March 13th was Friday. Yes, I should have emphasized that. So yep. I mean, this mm -hmm. is truly, I mean, Mm -hmm. Unprecedented. This is crazy. Well, I, I shouldn't say unprecedented because that kind of stuff was going on in 2000. Um, in 2008. Um, right. Yeah. So, all right. So, as we talk about the monetary policy response, I'd like you to think about it in subsets. So, I'd like you to think about it from our ability to do asset purchases to lower rates and expand the Fed's balance sheet. I'd like you to think about it from the lending facilities that we uh, work through to provide liquidity to various markets um, as we see turmoil and, and roiling of markets. And then I'd like you to reference the um, regulatory parameters to really provide some relief to the impact that's gonna happen to deposits um, that are being made on the balance sheets of banks. And I want you to think about that from the perspective of, again, all the liquidity we provide, we never provide it directly to a person. So you may do a simulation. I know I did simulations with my students where you're trying to do the buying and selling of bonds. And it's almost as if the central bank is doing it directly with people. That is not how this works. We work through depository institutions, through uh, primary dealers, and their depository institution. So that's gonna have an impact on the balance sheet of a bank <clears throat> and it's gonna change leverage ratios. So I've heard it said repeatedly by our head of supervision, Mike Johnson, that the banks in the lead up to the financial crisis and the great recession, the banks were a, a part of the problem, a large part of the problem. This time, the banks aren't part of the problem. The banks, the depository institutions are part of the solution. So I want you to think about that. All right, if you'll advance. So what is highlighted in red here are 
traditional monetary policy actions. We've been buying treasury securities. Look, the money supply grows historically. There's a trend growth. Those are liabilities that, that pay, those paper notes that are dollars are a liability on the Fed's balance sheet that have to be offset by the asset side of the balance sheet that are the treasury security. So this is very traditional, very conventional monetary policy. Our lending facilities, providing liquidity to various markets, long before the Fed got into the monetary policy um, work at the creation of the Fed, we were created to be the lender of last resort. We have, be, we have been lending to financial institutions, to depository institutions through the discount window since our creation. And that is 100% a way that um, depository institutions that can't get um, lending in the markets come you know, to and provide collateral. It's all with good collateral backing it. Repos, the repo market, while this is really pretty much invisible to most people, the repo market is just a way that markets transact. So repos are simply collateralized loans. There's a lot of money market funds out there that seek return. And so they're gonna lend through the repo market through um, counterparty lenders and they're going to seek return. So in, you know, this is just part of conventional monetary policy. Think about prior to the crisis, the financial crisis, literally the trading desk at the New York Fed in a given week would be in the repo market, maybe um, $250 um, billion in a week, maybe on the high end a, 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 or excuse me, 250 million, a quarter of a billion dollars in a week, up to a billion dollars in a week of, of repo market activity. That changed dramatically because of the financial crisis. And we saw the Fed get more in the repo market um, with a blip that happened last September. Um, and then in the beginning of March, there were about $400 billion that began to um, be exchanged in terms of repos. Dollar swaps. Dollar swap lines are provided by the Federal Reserve to central banks around the world because global markets are dollar funded. And those central banks have to be able to have dollars to provide those dollars to their financial institutions so that they can get those out to, to their um, uh through their liquidity um, provisions. So these, again, are very traditional, conventional policy responses. If you'll advance. These next um, policy responses are innovations that were created in response to the financial crisis in 2008. So the Fed began to buy uh, mortgage-backed securities. This is what was called quantitative easing or QE1 and QE2. Inside the Fed, they're called large scale asset pur purchases. Yet another way to do some asset purchases, again, good collateral to, to provide liquidity out into the market, to provide stability in the markets. Under the lending facilities, um, these uh, the PDCF, the primary dealer's credit facility, the commercial paper, um, a facility, uh, uh, the money markets lending facility and TALF, these all were created in response um, to dealing with the financial crisis, literally to provide again, liquidity out there into the markets. The reason the commercial paper market says the real economy, this is, this is where employers through commercial paper markets help to make payroll and they're constantly seeking to get the funding to make payroll. So this is literally the real economy in action. Um, and we reinstated um, uh, in this response to the pandemic, these um, lending facilities that were innovations in 2008. 
you'll advance, please. Here you see the subset of innovations that have been created truly in an unprecedented way this year in response to the pandemic. For the first time, and this is truly unprecedented, the Fed has gone into the primary and secondary corporate bond market. Now, remember that when I was talking about the CARES Act, that there was funding for $454 billion put out of that stimulus package into the Treasury's Emergency Stabilization Fund. That's the back, backstop being provided through this, these facilities. So literally the Treasury is taking on the credit risk, the Fed is providing the liquidity, all of that's done through depository institutions. We got into the municipal and state bond market to provide that backstop, you know, state and um, municipal um, municipalities need to be able to lend and, and excuse me, borrow um, in this time as they're facing stressors. And so we created this facility. The Fed came under in intensive criticism in the, their response to the uh, financial crisis. They were, we, the Fed, the Federal Reserve was accused of bailing out Wall Street and not helping Main Street. That was a resounding criticism that came out of our response to the um, financial crisis. As such, we created this year the Main Street Lending Program, literally just completely innovative um, program where those that can't, they're, they're really too small to access the funding through the primary and secondary corporate bond markets, and they're too big to access funds through the Paycheck Protection Program. That's the sweet spot for those lenders that are supposed to access, or excuse me, those borrowers who are supposed to access the Main Street Lending Program. This program's being, but finally was stood up in July. There was a lot of back and forth with the Treasury because Treasury's the backstop. Both Treasury and the Fed had to do risk analysis and top, you know, risk tolerance analysis. And so that was being hashed out in all honesty, this program, if you look at the numbers to date, is not getting much uptick. And I'm just gonna say in general, the markets were roiling in March and in April, they, they were sta they've been stabilized. So there's just not been the same kind of liquidity being provided. Um, now the markets have stabilized um, as with the financial crisis. So there's, there's very little activity in these uh, facilities now. And then, as I mentioned, you had to provide from the supervisory perspective and regulatory perspectives, some waivers to help um, banks balance sheets as they literally affect the providing of this liquidity um, to the primary credit um, uh, dealers. And so in essence, I'd just like to say, this brings to light the fact that you can do monetary policy, but monetary policy has only so much that it can do. There has to be in concert, as Powell said, monetary policy working with fiscal policy. So you, you really need to see another round of the fiscal policy stimulus to address um, the issue of a potential K-shaped recovery. I'm gonna turn it back over to Princeton at this point. Cool, so before we let you go, we want to highlight these other two functions of the Federal Reserve. These, these are gonna be shorter, but they really did play a critical role in, in our response to the pandemic. So you know that we do payments. You, you know that that is, um, that is essential to what we do. And really of all the people that are going into the Federal Reserve still to work, while Amy and I uh, we both live in Noonan, and so we call ourselves the Noonan branch of the Atlanta Fed. Um, but, but there are workers still going into work, and those are those cash workers and the people who administer the payments networks that, that are still there. They're um, going in every day and, and responding to this and keeping the economy going. Um, 
So if you were able to go into the museum, you could still see cash workers being brought, being uh, working through all the cash. Um, I have a picture of coins there. The coins made big stories this year um, because of the, the national shortage. That shortage came from, I'll just give you the, the skinny on this. The, the shortage came from two spots. Um, if I ask you all to come on camera, you don't have to, but if we all raised our hands, who has a jar of coins on your dresser or in your bedroom or somewhere in the house? Um, we all hoard coins, right? Um, but it turns out none of us were taking those to the banks. So the banks weren't get, and there were many branch locations that were closed to begin with, so you couldn't take coins in. It's hard to put coins into the ATM, right? No mobile deposit from your phone of coins. So banks weren't getting coins deposited. Uh, therefore, banks weren't depositing coins in, into the Federal Reserve. So there was this break in the circulation of coins. And at the same time, the Fed couldn't order additional coins from the U.S. Mint because the U.S. Mint had actually shut down production and limited the shifts at the two mint facilities that produce circulating coins in Denver and Philadelphia because of the coronavirus, right? Those workers were, were not able to work in person either. So it did create a shortage. Um, all of the cash people and all the, the um, communications from them say that that's gonna work out over the next few months as, as things return to more normal status and we're all back in stores and those coins return to circulation and the mint revs back up for full production. Um, obviously electronic payments have just gone through the roof and we continue to facilitate those. And really as part of our larger work, we're just continuing to, to look at how uh, payments can go become even faster. So um, you know how your, um, your direct deposit for school uh, always hits sometime in the middle of the night on the day you're supposed to get paid. Well, that's been batched to the, your bank several days in advance, and they're holding that deposit until the day, you know, till the clock strikes 12.01 to put that money into your account. Not, don't hold me to 12.01, that's figurative. Mm -hmm. um, but, but the payments folks at the, in the retail payments office are looking at ways to speed up those ACH transactions, make those immediately verifiable and move money ever more quickly and ever more um, instantly verifiable. So there's a lot of work that's happening in the payment spectrum um, at the Atlanta Fed. Finally, consumer protection and community development. Um, Raphael has really taken a leading role in the Federal Reserve System. To, to talk about how, um, how we have a responsibility to make the economy work for everyone, right? And so, so our community development folks are part of, of a broad group of working called the Rework America Alliance. Um, they're working with, the, with a new tool called the PLIF tool that talks about how as people increase their skills and increase their certification and education, um, what does that do to their public benefits? And that, that's actually being rolled out not only to help policymakers devise effective systems, but it's actually being used in Alabama to actually help guide people on how they can plan for um, a lifetime of earning rather than just what's right in front of them. Um, there's the unemployment claims monitor. So we're looking at new tools to help communities understand their economic situation and to improve it. So uh, we're focusing on all of those and of course the, the pandemic just brings that into an important focus. So with that, I will open it up to you guys to ask questions of either one. We've had some in the, some conversation in the chat Oh, okay. um, and Chris has been answering some stuff. Thank you, Chris. And also, you all have been helping each other out. So there's a lot of good stuff in that chat um, and sharing stories about your own personal experiences, some of how you've helped to navigate some of these, um, to access some of the um, programs through the CARES Act and some of the implications. We're happy to answer additional questions you may have. And then finally, 
We always encourage you to visit our website, frbatlanta.org. We have, for those of you who are unaware, we have created a new book that's full of uh, the activities that go along with all of the infographics we've developed. So you can place an order there um, for that book um, and print out those um, where, the, where it's applicable worksheets and so forth. We're working on getting that um, posted to the website so that it's all in one place to access that. Um, and that's what and I've got. Charlie, you win the prize of being in carpool. And I'm assuming it's your Charlotte and not Kyle, but- um... Actually, I'm Kristen. <laughs> Those are my oh. children's names. <laughs> oh, well, there you go. well, that's awesome. And you win the prize doing carpool while you're listening to pandemic economics. So. Oh, I thought that said Chris. Chris, yes, yeah, Kristen. So Chris is correct. Yeah. yeah. Well, no, yeah, that, that's Charlotte, actually. Hey, I have a, I have a question, I, oh. just a real quick one. Um, how do you guys think this would affect the, or, or does it at all have an impact on like, 10 years from now, monetary policy? Because you you admitted that like even Chairman Powell is sort of like to the point where he's like, we've sort of done what we could do. <laughs> like it's all, it's kind of on fiscal. Is that gonna, in your opinion, and I know you don't speak for the Fed, but in your opinion, how does that play out for the future of monetary policy and how people you know respect it moving forward? So I'm, I'll say um, that they are actually, <laughs> So they developed new tools to deal with the size of our balance sheet and had been working through the new tools. Like, so I mentioned the repo market. There's also what are called reverse repurchase agreements, reverse repos, and an, an, a, a rate associated with that and so forth. And they'd been working through all of this because, I mean, our balance sheet was just over 4 trillion and they were shrinking it. And now it's over 7 trillion because of all of this. And they've been trying to deal with that and how to, what's gonna be the new normal. And now this has thrown them into a situation where I think they're gonna have to address tweaks to what we were perceiving of as the new normal as you see with the framework, which they've been um, working on and so forth. So I think that first and foremost, they're all data driven. They're gonna analyze the data, the incoming data. They're gonna make their decisions based on the data. They're gonna adjust the tools based on the data and the efficacy of the tools to address the issues related to our dual mandate. We are legally mandated by Congress to address price stability and maximum employment. And, um, you know, I think they're going to continue to work through uh, tweaks to what is really the new conventional monetary policy, the unconventional conventional monetary policy in this new environment with a balance sheet that's as large as it is. Um, I've also heard, you know, I, I don't think I've said this, but I've also heard in speeches that all the presidents have said, certainly Powell, other governors, and um, definitely Raphael, that until the pandemic is addressed, you know, this is a public health crisis. And there has to be a resolution to the public health crisis and getting that under control because you're not gonna see, certainly not gonna see full recovery until you would, you know, address that. And, and that's my thoughts, Princeton. Yeah, so Susan, I just pulled the, the reason I stopped sharing was I pulled the link for the, the, da, the dashboard. It'll mm -hmm. be in the, but there's the link to the Fred dashboard. Um, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, the other thing I would say, I think the most interesting part of what Amy was sharing about those how those buckets have evolved over time. I mean, it's it's that we are really, I think our financial system continues to evolve in the United mm -hmm. States. We have a very dynamic, very innovative, constantly changing, constantly evolving financial system. 
and global its, financial system. I mean, really, yeah. it's global. Yeah, that's yeah, that's that's a better way to say it. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, American financial, American monetary policy is going to have to continue to evolve. I mean, we're not going to go. I doubt we ever. I've heard people say we're never going to return to an eight hundred billion dollar balance sheet, right? I mean, that's just not, not. I mean, I don't think it. But in the same time, when all those speeches were happening, that we weren't going to get, weren't going to get back to um, eight hundred billion from four trillion. I don't think anybody expected seven trillion. So, you know, that's. Mm-hmm. I think. I think we're just going to continue to see that, and I think. I think that's comforting to me about the Federal Reserve is that there are really incredible people that are that are actually thinking about what the next steps will be and how to safeguard this. But like Amy said, it's it's all about watching where those stress points are in the in the market. So so when municipalities couldn't get couldn't enter the the and sell their bonds in the in those markets this year. Then, then the Fed stepped in and recognized that that was a constriction, uh, like mm-hmm. a, a kink in the in the mm-hmm. circulatory system of the financial system, so that funds weren't going from savers to municipalities through those normal channels of that bond market. So the Fed stepped in and provided that liquidity. Mm-hmm. Um, I think we're going to have to continue to have ever more sophisticated ways of looking at where and anticipating where those kinks are going to be. Mm -hmm. and to keep all the money moving around. And I'll just add one other thing that I think has been really fascinating. There's increasing, there's increased discussion about pricing in the impact financial to the financial markets and risk analysis associated with climate change. And we are hearing there's increased research being done internally and discussions, increased discussions and even speeches by presidents and, and governors and so forth addressing that. So that's going to be another factor when you say 10 years out, Chris. Um, they are definitely looking at, you know, what is imminent. That is, I mean, we've heard, we've, we've heard, Princeton and I have heard these economists talk about the, the true existential threat that has to begin to be addressed. And um, I mean, so again, that's, that can be controversial to some, but that is happening, that that discussion is happening. And I don't know if well, wants you, to add anything to it. To, to add mm-hmm. one more thing to that, if that, if that's not enough bad news, you know, there's um, <laughs> there's the whole thing that we are a mature economy, a mature developed economy, and all of our demographics say that we're not going to see, we, we, you know, 5% growth, 4% growth would be great, but mm, probably not. You know, so so that's one of the challenges of, of what monetary policy looks like in the future is what is a rational goal for the economy and how do we sustain that and what what does that look like just based on our demographics as a country as we age and as we, you know, as our growth rate slows. I mean, at this point, we're basically only growing our population through immigration. So, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. you know. Net in migration. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Wait, wait, end on a downer. Yeah. <laughs> it's all gonna be good, hey, guys. This yeah. this was fantastic. I mean, we, we really need like I feel like we need like every high school teacher to, to be on this. So we may need to run this again at some point. I don't know. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Uh, it's six. Thank o'clock, you, Chris. Bro. Thank yeah. You Thanks everybody for Thank joining. You. It's so Christmas good to break. see you, people. Have it's a nice wonderful day. More than tomorrow. boxes. <laughs> yes. Yeah. And I will um I will get this up on YouTube sometime tomorrow. It might be late tomorrow afternoon. Uh, certainly before Monday morning. So um, thank you for joining. We appreciate it. Amy and Princeton. Thank you very okay. much. You thank you. Bye. Happy to do it. Thank you. Uh, See Kristen, you guys. I'll, I'll hang out for just a second. Bye. Right, thanks. Oh, okay. Yeah. Kristen, what you got? Um, I had a question unrelated to this. Um, all of this was amazing, and I can't wait to show this to my kids. Yeah. Um, for the EOC officially being done for econ. Um, I was just wondering if you guys had any talk at GCEE about doing anything with that. Like we kind of have like a vacuum of assessment now. So like <laughs> I know a lot of counties other than probably Gwinnett um, have kind of some ability or flexibility to create their own final 
but I didn't know if you guys had considered anything with that at all as far as I mean I know you guys can't do something and make it a standard assessment but with the resources you guys provide like if there were people who wanted to opt in and use it it would at least give us some kind of like I can I don't know baseline debt I don't I don't I don't know no, no, no. Y yes. No, you're, you're spot on. You're spot on. Yes. Yes is the short answer. Uh, it's a matter of resources at the moment. And it would be large. It would be 95% up to me to get the ball rolling on that. And right now I just don't have the time to allocate to it. We're also sort of waiting to see how systems handle this. Um, but yes, that has certainly been discussed at, at very high, like at our executive board meeting, which is the okay. highest level it goes at GCE. Yeah. Should we have some kind of test bank or even just a flat out some kind of GCE economic exam. Um, that won't get rolled out this year. I can okay. tell you that for sure, just because of other stuff that's on my plate. But yeah, no. it's being discussed for sure. The test okay. bank would probably happen before some kind of official assessment. But yeah, we've talked about like developing, uh, like there's a test out there called the TUS test. I don't know if you've ever heard of that, T-U-C-E. Um, no. It's a test of understanding critical economics or something like that. And I forget who puts it out, but we've even toyed with that idea. So I imagine something will come eventually, but okay. not, no, not this year. You're going to make your own finals for this year. And then do you know, like, I don't know who you guys get the state office when you deal with all of that. Are they, is there a possibility that is, it's done that they'll release like previous ones or that we'll have be able to get access to old ones? Yeah. I asked that question too. Um, and the answer uh, I asked that question in confidence, but they, the, the gist of the answer was probably not because um, there would be a, <laughs> as stupid as this sounds, there would be a possibility that let's say Richard Woods was, uh, or a, 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 like somebody else came into office, I'm trying to word this very carefully, somebody else gets elected in the next uh, superintendent cycle, they may want to reinstate that test. So okay. not for the next couple of years until they find out that, you know, this is definitely a for sure thing. We're not testing economics anymore. That that makes total sense. <laughs> yeah. So that's why they're probably not going to go and release all those tests. I imagine though, uh, I'm actually going to, I'm going to stop recording.